When I was 40, I thought I knew a lot. And then I turned 50 and I thought, oh my gosh, when I was 40, I didn't know much of anything. Now I am 67. Yep, Medicare. And yeah, and when I look back to 50, while I knew a lot more than when I was 40, I didn't know nearly as much as I do now. Can't wait till I'm 80. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. You got that. So raise your hand if you look forward to a birthday ending in zero and 20 doesn't count, and neither does 30. So can't wait to be 40. Oh, no, wait, 50, 50 is going to be amazing. Oh, that's, that's not right. It's 70. 70 is going to be the greatest birthday of all. Yeah, exactly. So you feel my pain. And the fact that we cringe and feel this dread about getting older. I have a confession to make, OK? So I have been worried that by doing this talk today, that I am committing some kind of a career suicide because I'm publicly disclosing my age. And that got me thinking, what the heck? So, all right, I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to share a tiny bit of history. The retirement age of 65 was first floated in the late 1800s when life expectancy was much shorter. Today, of course, life expectancy is much longer. And what allowed that to happen? Innovation. But we haven't innovated around the way we think and talk about getting older. And that needs to change. Not to make me, or you for that matter, feel better around our next milestone birthday, but to make our society better. So how did we get to this place where we cringe instead of celebrate? Well, a lot of reasons, but the biggest one is that we have allowed powerful interests and their media to define and value age. So young equals health, beauty, and high value, and old equals sick, ugly, and low value, or no value. Now, media is composed of two main parts, which would be language and images, or words and pictures. So picture this. You walk into a room, you meet somebody new, and your senses kick into high gear as you evaluate each other, as you take stock of each other, right? You engage in conversation for the first time. Your senses of smell, taste, touch, hearing, and sight. And every piece of research that I have seen in the past 29 years of studying com hum human communication has shown me something similar to this, that sight towers over all the other senses when it comes to making value judgments. Do I like that person? Do I want to see her again? Do I want to work or do business with him or her? So how are old people seen? How are we shown in the visual media? Well, we're most often shown alone. Or if we're with somebody, it's somebody who's taking care of us or helping us, uh, an adult child, a caregiver, a medical professional, somebody who's teaching us, like in this visual. In movies and on television, we're most often shown as slow and confused. And if you're a woman, of course, there are additional penalties, including being portrayed as unattractive and silly and ditzy and asexual. Of course, asexual, right? That old lady on that screen over there, she ain't having no sex. Uh-uh, no way. <laughs> OK, we're almost never shown at work or using technology even though we spend more than $80 billion a year on it, and certainly never on a TED stage. So it's no wonder people think we're past our prime and without a place in modern society. These images are false. They are incredibly damaging, and they need to change. Now let's switch over to the other half of the media equation, which is language. Now language is something I have expertise in, and I know that language influences the way we think, feel, and behave. It's what the big advertisers pay billions for. A diamond is forever. Just do it. And my all-time favorite, Las Vegas. What happens here stays here. <laughs> yeah, better, right? OK, so here's something that's very common. When older people forget something, we often joke that we're having a senior moment. Show of hands, who in this room has ever forgotten where you've left your phone? Uh, yeah, exactly. Every hand should go up. Yet you don't tell yourself at that moment that you have early onset dementia. <laughs> nope. According to neuroscientist Dr. Daniel Levitin, you tell yourselves you're just very busy, you've got a lot of distractions, and sometimes things just fall through the cracks, 
right? So we older people are not doing ourselves any favors by proclaiming senior moment every time we forget something because by doing that, we are perpetuating the stereotype that our brain function automatically and inevitably declines as we get older. Cognitively, we're just not all there anymore. It's a given, right? It's a lie. <laughs> In fact, only 8.8% of us will suffer from cognitive decline. Not to put too fine a point on it, but that means 91.2% of us still have all our marbles. But we've been persuaded the exact opposite is true, that we're going to lose it as we age. So tell that to music legend Quincy Jones, the amazing Betty White, and of course, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So today I am taking a stand and I'm calling BS on senior moments because they're not. We older people, like younger people, we're just very busy. We've got a lot on our plate and sometimes things just fall through those darn cracks. Okay, now, no conversation on language would be complete without taking on anti-aging because stopping aging, reversing it, has become compulsory. It's an obsession, and it's been egged on and financed by the anti-aging industry to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars per year. In fact, as I was preparing for this just a few weeks ago, an article crossed my desk from a major publication that reported that Silicon Valley engineers in their 30s and 40s were getting cosmetic procedures done so they wouldn't be outed as old. Now, I will tell you, I admit taking some comfort in reading that article in that it was men for a change, worried about their looks instead of women. Come on, this is crazy. I mean, think about it. Think about it. I ask you, would we buy products and services labeled anti-woman, anti-youth, anti-you-name-your-group? Okay, these words and pictures that I'm talking about today, they are very sticky. What that means is that they are persuasive even though they can be false. So it is no wonder that companies don't want to hire us or they fire us well before we're ready and, frankly, well before they should, which brings me to the most important part of this talk. Workplace age discrimination is one of the last great bastions of acceptable prejudice. Yeah, also it's illegal, yet companies get away with it. These same ageist companies that won't hire us and fire us have lobbied very effectively to weaken the existing laws so they are now so toothless it's become nearly impossible to prove a case of age discrimination. Maybe it's happened in your family. Uh, a loved one gets laid off and no matter how hard they try, they cannot get hired. All of those years of experience, all that depth of knowledge and expertise erased. It happened in my own family. Imagine feeling that helpless and that invisible. But here's the truth, and once again, the research backs me up. Old people bring a ton of good juju to the job. Yeah, we do. <laughs> With our vast knowledge and experience, we are able to assess and solve problems and predict outcomes much more quickly than younger people. In fact, you do not want to go to a movie with me unless you want to know the ending before it's over. Also, older people are more engaged. That means they like their jobs, they're happy to be there, and they do their best work and they're much more productive. The most fascinating thing about that is that companies with the most engaged workforces are on average 22% more profitable than those with the least which forces us to discuss the most pernicious and sadly most common excuse older workers get for not being hired or being fired, that were too expensive. So let me put an end to that thinking once and for all. Compensation for the average worker doesn't increase indefinitely. No, it actually levels off after about 30 years of service, even starts to decline in certain circumstances. So the tiny additional costs of 1% to 2% are more than offset by the significantly higher profits. Okay, so if you're still not on board with what I'm saying, I've got a much more self-interested reason for you to get behind me. And that is this. You know that big chunk of Social Security that gets taken out of your paycheck? Well, it's going directly into mine. Yeah. 
Social Security is a massive generational transfer of wealth from young to old. And I am sure that I speak for many of my peers when I say thank you. But here's the kicker. By 2034, the U.S. Census Bureau projects that people 65 and older will outnumber people 18 and younger for the first time in our history. And because we're all living much longer, that means you're going to be working much longer, retiring much later, and paying much more in taxes. Ugh, that does not sound fun. So what are some solutions to this? Well, there are a few, and I've got two of them. The first is that you could all start having a ton more kids and having them much younger, so when it's your turn to retire, their wealth can be transferred to you. Any college students in this room? Time to get started on that. <laughs> but I've got a better one that takes that pressure right off. Many of you already are or will become bosses with hiring powers. Hire older workers. Not only will they do a job you need done and do it well and be happy about it, but because they'll continue to pay taxes, including Social Security taxes, that much less of it will have to come from you. By the way, age discrimination works in the opposite direction, too. Any time we paint an entire generation with a single brush, we're engaging in it. So let's call BS on age discrimination in all its forms. What do you say? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm Ruth Sherman. I'm 67. So yeah, kind of old. And I know a lot. And for that and other good reasons, I'm not done yet. So stop trying to get rid of me. Thank you. Thank you.